Oh, we gotta be joking. Whoa, that's a big fish. Don't do that. Come on, fish. Oh, that's a beauty. Oh, that's a big one. Holy moly. Woo! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Right there? Yeah, like 500 yards I was wondering why you guys were trolling that area. Yeah. Cool. How was it? What was the size? Uh, his was about 32. I got a 28. Sweet! So I've been coming to Mongolia for the last 16 years to try to understand the ecological change that's happening to the rivers here. One of these places is on the Egg Ore River, which is the upper watershed of Lake Baikal, which is the largest lake in the world, which is in Russia. And in this place, there are shifts in climate that are occurring because Siberia is, an, is a large landlocked area that's heavily influenced by change. But then there's also changes occurring with more and more people coming here to recreate and go fishing. And with that type of pressure, you might see changes in the ecology of the river. So we're often asked why why do you want to come out here and try to study this Hucho Taiman, the world's largest trout? Why do you want to study the other fishes in the river? Well, the Taiman not only are this world's largest trout, but they're an indicator species of change. There's only a few of them per river mile, so they're really hard to capture, but that also means they're like canaries in the coal mine when they change in their populations or they change in their sizes. The river itself is starting to change. And so for me, the Taiman isn't just something we want to capture, study, and release, but it's an indicator for the whole ecosystem's health. Shut, shut, shut. <laughs> <laughs> I can't <even> anymore! <laughs> okay, let go of the anchor. Ready? Ready? Yeah! Oh, Come on! <laughs> Good fish! Yeah. Sure. East 101 97 I'm Zeb Hogan, I'm a biologist at UNR I'm here on the Egg River in northern Mongolia, fishing with Gonzreg, who just caught this fish, and Sudeep Chandra, another bi biology faculty member. In this net is a taiman, it's also known as a Eurasian giant trout. This is the largest trout species in the world. This little guy, he's probably about two feet long. And you can see he's beautiful, uh, kind of olive green head, rusty red tail, black spots all along the body. In this stretch of river, uh, anglers have caught this species of fish over five feet long. So, so Sudipan and I and Gonzerg were part of the original team working out here. And we've been working here 2003, so almost 15 years. So coming back to this same location for 15 years, year after year, sometimes twice a year. Uh, so I've, I think Sudip has too. We've really developed a, a connection to this place, uh, to the people that we work with. And more than any other place in the world, I've spent more time on this river than I have anywhere, even in my hometown. I mean, I think all of us felt like it was a special place right away, and that, that feeling hasn't gone away. So the nice thing we've done on this trip is we've been able to take a handful of people from back home in the United States and bring them here to share in the culture and the ecology. So how do you get to central Siberia and far northern Mongolia if you're from the United States? Well, by the time we get to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, there's been 27 hours that passed. But that journey wasn't over 
just by getting to the capital. We get a few hours sleep and the next thing you know, we're on this magnificent helicopter ride flying 300 miles to the west. And the helicopter ride clearly shows you a landscape that has so few humans on it. Lots of forests that are lit up with color, bright yellow larch waiting to drop their needles down. Rivers that are wide and curving back and forth like a river that's relatively untouched. These are the types of things that we just don't experience necessarily back at home. I recognize that not everybody can come to Northern Mongolia and experience this place, but what I do hope that people at home think about a little bit is that we do have a common thread from place to place. Whether you know it or not, the changes that you make at home can influence the places here in Siberia and vice versa. Well, we woke up this morning on Thursday, October 4th at the camp and it's snowing and it snowed two inches last night and it doesn't look like the snow is going to let up. So we are going to try to get out there and keep collecting information. It's kind of crazy and it's kind of cold right now. Which way do we go around? This way? No. Other way. This way? Other way, yeah. One or three times. I like one time. <laughs> well, on our travels up to the monastery, it was this really frigid cold morning on the river, about a two hour boat ride. And we get to this monastery site and it's snowing. This was a place during the Soviet era that was destroyed by Stalin the dictator. And the buildings were raised and the monks were killed in this region. And there's a strong cultural history since the 1930s to keep the stories alive from this region and the Buddhist shaman faith going. And in 2004 and five, my colleagues and I were part of a science team mixed with cultural economic team to try to rebuild the watershed. And we've helped rebuild this monastery temple area, the sacred site for the Mongolians, which drew hundreds of people from the countryside and today continues to serve as a cultural center point for this valley. So it, uh, they wanted to us to follow the rule. With the Buddhism it wasn't possibility so that's why they destroyed all the temples and that's why they were, they were trying to destroy the religion, our religion. And 2006, six, and then we rebuilt this monastery, which the, like you guys helped uh, donate them lo lots of money. They all helped to rebuild this temple. This particular day was so cold. We get up there and they welcome us with open arms. We're invited into uh, the caretaker's building where the sweet lady creates milk tea for us to warm up on and gives us pastries to eat to kind of unburden our, our stomachs and it was such a nice warm welcome going up there it's something that i cherish year after year when i end up coming here <laughs> boldo boldo came up to me and i probably saw you he goes no it's not gonna be good it's not good <laughs> <laughs> well it, if it's not windy it's okay but it, it's windy windy yeah Wind. We'll see. Now we're going to little little eggs, so don't don't uh, don't poach it and don't drive right through it either. We're Go there. very very quiet as far to the bank as you can. Well, I mean, one of the cool things about this project is from the very beginning, it was a team of researchers who were working out here, and. We've stayed together. We've, you know, the researchers have stayed together and continued to work out here for 15 years now. And we actually filmed an episode of Monster Fish here about 10 years ago. It was one of the first episodes of Monster Fish that I ever did. Every year, different people are involved. So Sudeep and I will come out most years. We, like, we love to come out. And then uh, graduate students will come out. So Lainey and James have a chance to come out and, and do a research project. Uh, Joe's here as part of a National Geographic mentorship program. 
Gonzerig uh, first started working on the project when you were 17? So Gonzerig has been working on the project since he was 17 and done all different kinds of research. Uh, we've looked at movement patterns, looked at uh, the, the number of fish in the river, um, looked at spawning behavior. And so every year there could be a little bit of a different focus with different people involved. And so one of the objectives of the project from the very beginning was to try to understand enough about the ecology of the fish to be able to manage it sustainably. And by manage it sustainably means how should the river be managed, how should the fishing be managed so that there are big fish in this river for the future. Why is it important to you, the local people here? Why is the river important? No water is no local here, you know. Uh, no river, no locals. My name is Panzerik. Uh, I'm fish biologist. This time has very special fish, you know. Uh, also freshwater indicator fish, you know. If the time and lived water is totally clear water, you know. We know the time and it's like same age for me, almost same, right? Or some is older than me. And that's why I love the time and I sh we should save the, that fish, right? Often around the planet, when we go off and work in these places, we meet communities of people and landscapes that are intact. But more importantly, we meet people that have the same sense of humanity. We have friends like our friend Gonzerig, who was a student studying fishes with us, and now he's a guide studying the rivers, but also trying to protect the fish. People are naturally wanting to caretake their landscape. And the question is how to go about doing that in times of change. Do you think it's strange when, like, Lainey and maybe you, I, some people, they get very, very upset if a timon dies. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way as well? Yes, if the time died, uh, my feeling is really bad, you know, like, just my heart's like crying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lainey Galland. I'm a PhD student um, in Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology program at University of Nevada, Reno. Well, I came into the program um, just bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to study Lahontan cutthroat trout and rainbow trout. Um, I kind of out of nowhere was approached by the UNR kind of monster fish research team, and they, they had asked me to do some genomic work in Timon that had never been done before and within three weeks I had sampling packs and gallon Ziploc bags shipped over to Mongolia and within three months I was I was over here seeing it for the first time. 41 to 41. his bottom yeah. jaw. Yeah. Look he's got those teeth too. Doesn't he? Right there. Down here. Yeah. All the Look at those here. teeth. Holy moly. He's got multiple rows of teeth. Yeah. Those are sharp. <laughs> Conservation, I just care about it. I care about the natural world that surrounds us. I care about making sure that it persists far into my future and, you know, our children's and children's children's futures. So I came over, it completely changed my life. Every, nothing would be the same after my first trip here. And I can't stay away. I mean, every year I've come longer. Every year it's been an expansion of previous years of research, cultural immersion, everything. Um, most of my time has been on the river, on the water, and so I spend a lot of time in the countryside with individuals who really care about the land and care about the, the water. They're using it for their livestock, they're using it for laundry, they're using it for drinking, raising families, and, and often eating, um, you know, eating fish that are caught in the river. But the attitude about time and the river in general has, is changing, um, changing for the better. So instead of you know holding up a trophy fish and going, look what I got and look what we ate, it's transitioned into you know seeing our photos, seeing our catch and release and, and explaining our story and, and their story is changing to look at this amazing fish and we let it go and it was just really beautiful. So it's really a great feeling. Um, it's the first time that I felt that a project is really full circle. 
Oh, you know, with the changing weather, maybe the fish will start freaking out and saying they need to eat before uh, before it gets too cold. And they they could be eating today. Okay. 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 Your legs always good. Ghana. Good job. <laughs> My wife and me always talk like when we get older, older, not old, like around maybe 60. Then we could live in countryside. They're herding some animals, you know, more quiet. Because the big city is so busy, you, know? you have to think about a lot of things. But here it's just more relaxing and kind of like that, you know. There's the lots of beautiful places all around the Mongolia. I wish I can reborn here again. Even for like same as me, I didn't know that timing is very important for us, like you know, so before I start guiding, I didn't know that. We don't have enough number of the fish here. Also, it's very uh, uh, special species in the whole world. So that's why we ha have to care about this. We must, you know. Uh, if I see the uh, people caught the fish, and I just go there, okay, this is the timing, and then you guys can handle like this. Or if you hold in the wrong way, it can hurt the fish, you know. Even they releasing the fish, it, that fish can, might die. The problem is we can't check the, every single fisherman is how they're fishing, so. You know, they're always the group of the people always fishing together. If you can share that for one person, that means like four person, right? So. It's kind of like, uh, it feels like uh, helping somehow, sharing the information, teach them uh, how they can fish right way. The last few years, I think the people start thinking about the timing. Feels like the wave is coming, you know, like it's coming to the right way. On behalf of the science team, we've been coming here for many years, but it's only in the last half decade less that we've been able to connect um, with the guides. So my toast tonight is to the guides who are willing to integrate with scientists, and uh, cheers to you. Cheers. Thanks, Mongolian guys. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Mongolia is a country that, yes, rugged on the outside and really kind on the inside, is being impacted by climate change in a dramatic way. They have a lot of internal conflict of how to develop the landscape while trying to protect their nature. Those conversations are being had, much like we have them in the United States. Often, I start thinking and worrying about the place here, thinking, gosh, what is it like to have this much change from climate and disturbances in such a short period of time. But then I start thinking, it's actually kind of positive to think about these changes. The people here are so empowered to live with that change. It's such a rough landscape. And I think if we can work together to try to understand the changes, but predict what it's gonna be like in the future, we can 
be more positive about the betterment of humanity. What's your feeling about the future of Mongolia? Well, first, I'm really hoping we still keep in the, this culture. You've seen here, like, how the people living. There's the open area in the mountains and forests, and you know, lots of um, sheep and goats and cows, and people just, they're not worried about the next day. They're just living, like, happily. Maybe like after 50 years or 100 years, it, it might change. But I'm sure we still have in the, this culture a long time. Mongolia is such a rich place with culture and landscape that I think things will change. But change is okay because in the heart, Mongolians are very strong and kind. And I think that will persist over time. I hope yeah. so. Yeah, me too. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love it. You're welcome. <laughs>